In the daytime, I would go do an interview with the press and take pictures and speak nicely in front of a crowd. And later on that night in private, we would all talk about gathering weapons and uh, how to prepare for combat so that we can take Canada back. My name is Elisa Hadigan. When I was a teenager, I was recruited into Canada's most powerful white supremacist group in the 90s, the Heritage Front. On your feet, white brothers! White power! On your feet, white brothers! White power! White power! Hell victory! Within a couple of years, I went from uh, a naive kid to being the face of the organization until I uh, eventually turned around, testified against them, and helped to shut them down. I immigrated to Canada when I was 11 from communist Romania. And at the time, I came from a totalitarian communist government where identity and diversity was completely discouraged to a country where everything was encouraged. So I was 16, uh, just dropped out of high school and uh, really angry and alone and didn't have a sense of belonging, didn't know who I was. And one day I was watching television and I saw a guy, clean cut man in a suit, talking about what's wrong with being proud of your European heritage. And I thought, that's right, what's wrong with that? I left a message on the hotline saying I just wanted some information and can somebody call me back. And that very day, the leader of the Heritage Front, uh, Wolfgang Droge, called me. He was the first person to show interest in who I was and what I wanted for my future. Pretty soon, within a month, he had become my father figure when I was speaking at rallies. I memorized the lines that I was given. I didn't write them. Most of the time, I was told what to say and I repeated it. And it was very effective. The way you recruit someone into white supremacy is to first have a conversation about what that other person is really afraid of. And that fear is always fear of the unknown. You're afraid of the faceless intruders, that's what they call them. I was taught to figure out what people were afraid of and inflame their fears. Like maybe they lost a scholarship to an Asian student or their girlfriend left them for a black guy. And then I would give them a reason why they, it wasn't their fault. I didn't have a family and they became my family. So you look for people who are vulnerable and lonely and don't have a sense of belonging. But even in the 90s, when I was recruiting people, I still had to do it one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. Unfortunately, with the advent of the internet, somebody can recruit from 2,000 miles away. The message propagates faster than anything we've ever seen before. In the last 20 years, we've seen a huge difference in the way white supremacy has been reflected. And the face of white supremacy has gone from the, the typical combat boots, uh, skinhead with a swastika on his neck and, you know, violent uh, look to a softening, clean cut approach. Charlottesville didn't make Nazis pop up like mushrooms out of the blue overnight. They, they already had those beliefs. They were already there. It's just that now they feel like they've gained in strength and in numbers. They can go around openly wearing shirts and hats saying, make America great again. At first I joined because I needed a family and a sense of belonging and I was swept in by this idea of, of uh, empowerment and feeling proud of myself. Within two years I realized that that pride was manifesting as hate toward everybody else. People would be targeted for harassment, for violence and um, Unfortunately, a lot of the people being targeted for harassment and violence were people are from the LGBTQ community. And at one point I was given the phone number and address of a lesbian activist and told to harass her, to terrorize her, to call her from a pay phone and, you know, tell her horrible things. And when I was given the information and when I was given the names and phone numbers of people that I was supposed to attack and terrorize based on their sexual orientation, I suddenly realized that I identified with them. So that was the moment, the big breakthrough for me. I realized that the people I was supposed to attack were me. Realizing that there is no other, that I am you and you are me, was profound for me. And I was 18 when it hit me and I didn't know what to do. I was completely, um, I belonged to them. I didn't have a sense of my own identity anymore, so um, at that point I, I attempted suicide. I uh, took a bunch of pills, I woke up in the hospital. When the nurses told me that they couldn't let me go unless I had somebody to pick me up, I reached in my pocket and uh, the phone number I had in my pocket was the number of that lesbian anti-racist activist and I called her that night. 
And after that, we spoke in secret for a month and I decided to not just leave the Heritage Front, but I had enough information to try to shut them down and that's what I did. So I spied on the Heritage Front for four months. I uh, gave about 30 affidavits to the OPP and eventually I testified against the leader and two others. And they were convicted based on my testimony. And while they were in jail, the Toronto Sun broke the story that the second leader of the Heritage Front was a CSIS agent who had also helped contribute money and funds to the organization. So it was a one-two punch. I helped to send Wolfgang to jail and then Grant Bristow was exposed as an agent and uh, went into witness protection and the organization collapsed. Racism doesn't have a color, doesn't have a border. It's, um, it's endemic and it's up to all of us to work to shut it down.